Okay, so thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Um, the aim of these um, health talks are uh, actually to provide awareness about um, gut health, um, about the, that means, all right, the, um, the intestinal function, uh, which is related to various um, health conditions. And this is what we're going to through throughout the sessions, throughout the sessions. So this is session one, it's going to be an overview. Um, at the end of this session, I will tell you our plan for next year. All repeated sessions are live um, for sort of to, en to engage with public. Okay, so throughout this overview, so before I start, this is an initiative of the Malta Colorectal Cancer Awareness Group in collaboration with the Research and Innovation Development Trust of the University of Malta. And I am the, the I was going, I'm going to be providing these sessions. Um, so the main aim is the awareness. Um, we will be very happy if we can receive uh, any donation towards um, towards the uh, colorectal cancer research. So let's start. So over uh, on in this overview, I'm going to describe um, the gut. It is actually the gastrointestinal tract. So sometimes you see it written as GIT, but today we're going to refer to it as gut, the gut. Um, and uh, the gut is, if you think about um, sort of our health and intestinal function, we have two major components. The first component is actually the fuel, which is the food, which we will not um, give any specific details about food in these particular sessions, because we're going to focus on what we call the engine. So the engine in this case is actually the gut and it's all its functions. Now, because the gut has also um, a high amount of um, beneficial bacteria and microbes, we will also indicate and, and, and go into the microbiota, which are these microbes that are associated with the gut, and how this um, affects health through disbalance, and that disbalance is called the dysbiosis. Uh, at the end of the session, I'll, go, I'll, I'll mention a couple of how microbiota are related and associated with health, and if this can be restored, and if yes, therefore, how the restoration um, should be done. So if you look at the gut, all right, there is the, um, the mouth, all right, which then you have the oral cavity, goes through a tube, which is called the esophagus, which leads the, the, the food will, will move on to the stomach. From the stomach, we go into the small intestines, which are the central uh, sort of pink part. And from the small intestines, um, it goes into the ascending, because it's going up, ascending uh, large intestine, goes transverse, and then descending large intestine. Okay. Um, so in terms of um, nomenclature, you have the oral cavity, the esophagus, the stomach, small intestines, the large intestines, the rectum, and the anus. So basically, if you think about this, this tube is basically has two openings, and both openings are for the external. And therefore, it's basically an external, the hollow, the, the, the hollow of this tube, which is called the lumen. The lumen is an external, um, is external to our body, but it's in, inside. Now, in addition to the tube, there are various organs that feed um, very important proteins that digest the food um, and also to emulsify fats, for instance. Um, and those include the liver through the gallbladder, which pro provides the bile acids, and the pancreas, which also provides a lot of uh, digestive enzymes. So the functions of the gastrointestinal tract, the gut, the main one is to digest food and absorb nutrients, but that's not the only one. It is definitely an immune learning hub. As I said before, okay, it is like an external tube inside of us. So 
immune cells have the possibility to interact with the external, um, to, to actually um, have an immune reaction. And because of that reaction, it learns uh, um, the, to, how to combat these pathogens if one day we actually are infected. So it's an absolutely excellent position for the immune cells to learn about the external. And the, the uh, gut is also the site of production of neurotransmitters and hormones and also other beneficial substances. And most of these substances are also synthesized by these microbes that, that are in a symbiotic, which means that, that both, both the host, which are us, and the microbes um, benefit from this um, uh, from this relationship. Um, of course, the microbes benefit from having the right environment in which they, they live, and we benefit because these microbes are providing us with additional digestive enzymes to take the most out of our food uh, and eventually absorb this uh, substances, but also transform particular substances into ben beneficial beneficial compounds which are important for our health. And we will mention these later on. Now, these beneficial compounds are called metabolites because it is part of the metabolism of, of, of the human body. Okay? So in terms of um, an image, sort of the gut is not... So, so in addition to having the digestion and absorption and all the metabolism related to it, it also provides hormones and neurotransmitters. So it's important in mood, pain. So there's a connection between the gut and the brain, um, but also provides the immune learning hub, which is extremely important for our defense and also tolerance to food substances. So if you look at the physiology of the gut, if I just take this particular tube and put it in one line, all right, like you can see here, a horizontal tube is the stomach, then the small intestine, and then the large intestine, which also we call the colon, right? Now, throughout that lining, if we look from the side of the lumen, which is the hollow part of the tube, you will see um, these pictures, that these images that you have um, beneath the tube. So like in the stomach, there's a lot of mucus layer being produced. And you can see that there are like pits throughout the surface of, of, the, of the intestinal lining. And those pits are important because they are going to produce the mucus that is required. Similar situation, if you go to the far right, you can see the colon, you have pits, and those pits are producing the mucus that is required. Um, for the intestinal lining. Now, the difference then in the middle is that in addition to pits, there are also finger-like protrusions, which we call villi, which are extremely important to increase the surface area of the small intestine for efficient absorption of nutrients. Okay, um, But again, there is also these uh, mucus layers. Also, we find special spaces like what we call, there is, you mentioned the Payer's patch there, this is where the immune cells are to, to actually learn about the external environment. Something which is common throughout is that the, um, the lining, the gut lining, is one cell thick. You can appreciate there that it goes like all, all throughout, even pits and also protrusions, it's all one cell thick. That is very important because we will look into today um, the that this one cell tick really needs to be a barrier, a very strong barrier, and that depends on the health status of the cells. So if we look at the functions of the gut, we can relate that to specific areas like buccal cavities, the ingestion and mastication, oesophagus, which links the pharynx to the stomach, stomach where it stores food into these uh, acidic, acidic gastric um, enzymes to digest proteins, 
Then you have the small intestines. There are different names there, duodenum and ileum. These, uh, these make up the small intestine. It's important for digestion and absorption. The colon, important for absorption of water, the rectum is formation and storage of feces, and the anus is for the digestion. Throughout, there are various glands that provide the digestive enzymes, we call them, okay? These functional proteins that are important to digest food, okay? So we can, you have salivary glands, gastric glands, the liver produces bile, which is important in the emulsification of fats, and the pancreas also produce these digestive enzymes. Now we mentioned the microbiota, the micro um, microbes in our gut, which is an absolutely very important factor in our health. The presence of the right um, diversity and the right abundance of these bacteria in our gut. Now, if you look at, so, so today there is a lot of uh, studies, uh, which we call the microbiome project. Okay? But if you look at the details of, of um, to define what are these microbiota, it's important to, to, to know that the gut is made up of 100 trillion microbes. So there are about 100 trillion microbes in our large intestines. Um, and this would involve um, around 5,000 different species of bacteria. Okay? Um, so if we look into detail, the, the, the abundance and diversity is extremely important, therefore, to, um, to, re, uh, to associate with specific um, healthy situations. For instance, um, the, the, the diversity and abundance would also regulate the stimulation of immune cells. It would also break down specific toxic compounds. It will actually digest or ferment different types of nutrients that we are not capable to um, do, but bacteria can do for us, okay? They can ferment for us. And for instance, one of the fermentation um, uh, output, yeah, is, are very important and health beneficial substances that we require every day. Now, we, we know a lot about these microbiota. We, we Today, instead of culturing them and try to identify these bacteria, we do sequencing of their DNA, and therefore we can actually very easily study, well, easily, but relatively uh, easier than before, um, study the, the diversity and abundance of these bacteria. And by today, we have even more than 32,000 um, samples sampled. When we say sampled, these kind of samples are fecal samples. Now, we also have a lot of studies, and both interventional studies and also observational studies, which show that the diversity of microbiota, uh, the higher the diversity, the wider the diversity, the healthier the, the individual. Uh, we also know that this uh, diversity and abundance is affected by diet and lifestyle, and we also know that it changes with age. So I said, as I said before, these uh, um, studying these microbiota, these microbes, we don't culture them as we used to do. So this you can show this an image of cultures, but we actually do DNA sequencing um, from one sample. Now to give you a little bit of understanding what we're talking about, okay, if a human cell is about ten microns, so is this like a size, size um, tape yeah so if a human cell is around 10 microns okay um, red blood cells are eight bacteria we're talking about 0.5 microns so this is just showing you relation of size of different cells that we mentioned now very important is that if a human body in average is made up of 30 trillion human cells the Microbiota amounts in our gut are of 100 trillion, okay? So they are even like 10 times more than we are as human cells. Now, if you think even further, if we look at the DNA content of a human and the DNA therefore content because of the diversity of these microbes, 
in the gut, um, they actually have much more codes, genes, yeah, codes for digestive enzymes. Okay, so that's why we do require these microbes to actually digest and increase the capacity of digestion of our fuel, which is the food. Now, not going into details of the names, although they are really interesting and nice names, okay? But what I wanted to state here, I told you that there are more than 5,000 species in a particular gut, and but the majority of them are the yellow box, okay? These are called, so we group these bacteria depending <clears throat> on the type. So these are the Fermicutes, which there are more than 200 different groups in, these, um, in this particular type. And uh, then we have the green box, which is, so the balance between the yellow and green box is extremely important in terms of health, okay? The green box are bacteria datas, and they, they are a collection of specific bacteria. But I want to show you that there are others. For instance, one particular bacterium that mo you most probably have heard um, constantly is, for instance, the bifidobacterium. So that goes into the blue box, okay? Um, but you might also have, have heard about the lactobacillus, okay? And that goes into the yellow box, okay? So this, this is basically grouping um, different bacteria according to the type. But what is interesting here is that if we take the balance between the yellow box and the green box, which now in terms of pie charts that you see on your left, the yellow is represented by pink and the green is presented by a blue green color. You can see that you can look at the a healthy situation, which we have a lot of Fermicutes and a good balance of uh, bacteria data and a controlled level of the others. So, but we need them. So the bifidobacteria are low in terms of abundance, but they are there and we need them. The difference between a healthy adult and an obese adult, for instance, you can appreciate that there is a new color coming in, which is the red color. So what is this red color? My, and these are the beneficial gut bacteria. The red color will represent the harmful gut bacteria. Okay. And these bacteria are called the proteobacteria. Okay. And you might have heard of Escherichia coli, Shigella, Capsiella. So these are what we call the pro inflammatory. Pro inflammatory, meaning that they, they um, promote inflammation, okay? That's what's pro-inflammatory. And we know that these bacteria and specific ones actually as well are associated with particular diseases, okay? Such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These two conditions are together called inflammatory bowel disease, but also others, so cystic fibrosis and stomach cancer, such as in the case of Helicobacter pylori, okay? which is associated with stomach ulcers and stomach cancer. <clears throat> Another small detail which is important is that, from, so now we're going to talk about the upper, going from the upper to the lower gastrointestinal tract. Okay, the upper being towards the mouth and the lower towards the large intestine. And, uh, and you can see that if you look at a bit the numbers there, okay, the numbers of bacteria um, actually increase substantially when you go from the upper to the lower, so with the highest concentration in the colon. And this is because also of the conditions. So in the colon, there is lack of oxygen, and most of the bacteria would thrive on that particular um, lack of oxygen. And also the pH is not low. Um, of course, the pH in the stomach is very low because it is acidic. And therefore we see differences as well of bacteria, but also of abundance going from the upper to the lower tract. 
Now, when we look at the hollow tube that we mentioned before, we, we, sh we I showed you the lining, and then I showed you also the uh, mucus, and then the lumen, which is the hollow part, in, in, which is the sort of the external hollow part. Um, there's also differences in bacteria when you go from just next to the cells towards the lumen. Okay, now this is important to consider because, of course, the sampling that we do for testing, it's basically mostly coming from the mucus to the fecal layers. Okay, um, luckily the 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 fecal layer, the the, the sort of uh, lumen bacteria associated with lumen are very close to what we see in the epithelial surface. So that's about about abundance and diversity. Um, we also know that there is a number of factors that impact this particular composition and, diver and abundance of bacteria, starting off with what we call the colonization. So at birth, okay, um, that is the first colonization of bacteria. It's the first time that the sort of neonate is moving towards the external, okay, and that uh, is a very important part in the colonization of the gut. And in fact, we see a huge difference between uh, individuals that, um, that, that have a different birth process, meaning the vaginal or the cesarean. There's also a big difference between feeding, so um, between formula fed and breast feeding. At adult point of view, then there is a lot of um, impact from stress, in terms of uh, psychological and metabolic and also exercise, a huge impact by diet, by pharmaceuticals, and also an impact of aging, of the aging process. Now, also geography is important, uh, and geography is also related with various factors together, so it's more of a complex um, factors in one. So if we go look at your left, so these are the examples of factors that actually could cause, therefore, a gut imbalance. So this particular bacterial imbalances. So age is one of them, um, diet, stress, medication, and the presence of pathogenic microbes. And these are sort of a collection of um, comparisons between the different abundances and diversities in different states. So if you look at just the healthy, you can see that throughout age, even the healthy um, combination of microbiota is going to change with age, and also shows within a specific age group, uh, for instance, which I showed before, the healthy adult as against the obese, where we see an increase in pro-inflammatory um, bacteria. Now, why diet influences this intestinal microbes? Okay, yeah, well, first diet provides nutrient to both the host, ourselves, but also to the bacteria in the gut. Keep also in mind that um, the diet and the presence of specific microbiota is also important, this particular combination, because microbiota have a larger collection of degradative enzymes, these proteins that actually digest food, Okay. And therefore, those that would have a beneficial microbiota in their gut would result in a better range of metabolic capabilities. Um, keep in mind as well that, of course, these microbiota produce uh, beneficial metabolites, and we will mention them in the next few slides. Um, okay, so if there is an imbalance, there are ways and means how one could um, restore this via supplementation with prebiotics, uh, it, but that depends on the type of disbalance and which bacteria are out of balance to actually um, focus and personalize that restoration. So I mentioned these metabolites, these microbiota-derived metabolites. What are these? So they are the output of um, digestion and absorption of specific nutrients and the transformation of substances 
into functional compounds. These functional compounds we call metabolites. Um, there are various, so they can be bile acids. A very important um, um, type of metabolites are the short chain fatty acids, SCFAs, which are majorly uh, produced by microbiota in the large intestine through carbohydrate fermentation. There are vitamins. We are not capable of producing all types of vitamins, and we need specific bacteria to actually produce um, particular vitamins, like vitamin K2. Uh, amino acids, which are the big, broken down from, from uh, proteins, but as we'll see in the next slide, um, th there are then synthesis of specific compounds that are of health benefit to us, which is performed by bacteria in the gut. Production of specific neurotransmitters, these are also metabolites. And by looking at these metabolites, um, we can actually identify and distinguish a normal healthy gut from a dysfunctional unhealthy gut. Okay. So, and at this balance of these uh, metabolites would contribute to what we call functional gut disorders. An example of functional gut disorder is irritable bowel syndrome, which is mainly due to a negative impact from diets. And that's why by restoring the gut, um, there is amelioration of IBS symptoms. So this uh, showing this list that I mentioned, all right? So there are some metabolites that microbiota would need particular substances from diet, like uh, CSFAs and, and amino acid metabolites, like tryptophan metabolites. And then there are others which would, um, that microbiota would need the presence of uh, bile acids to produce secondary bile acids. And microbiota, without any, any intervention or any requirement, they actually produce for us beneficial compounds such as vitamins. So a very short look at what are these short chain fatty acids. Um, uh, so very low short fatty SCFAs, short chain fatty acids, are linked with irritable bowel syndrome. Um, these are the three um, short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Okay? And butyrate and, and the others, but mainly butyrate in this case, um, are important to maintain intestinal barrier integrity. What does this mean? We showed that there's the epithelial lining. Uh, the gut lining is made up of one cell layer. That cell layer, if these cells are strong and healthy, they keep tight. And that's what is called the intestinal barrier. They keep very close together and tight. In fact, they have what is called tight junctions between them. If we lose this tightness, then we lose integrity. And, and unfortunately, we have um, compounds which we don't need um, that will start passively going into our tissues, and that would result in inflammation. These particular short-chain fatty acids are also important in mucus production, so I showed that before as well, and protection against inflammation because of this particular integrity issue. Okay? Now, if the lining is strong enough because there is a high amount of these short-chain fatty acids, which also provide energy to the lining cells, okay, then there is reduced risk of disease, also of, for instance, colorectal cancer. Now, most of these CSFAs that we produce are actually used by the body, so there is no waste, and mainly because um, there is a direct, they are used directly in the energy of these um, cell lining as well. Okay? We have various butyrate producing bacteria in our gut, and here I just show one of them um, or, or highlight one of them, uh, and that is F. prosnitsi. And because we really look for the presence of this and the abundance of this particular bacterium because it's a gut health marker. It really indicates to us that there is, uh, there is a healthy gut. 
Now, I understand that this might be look complicated in terms of, of the figure, but I just wanted you to appreciate that from dietary proteins in the presence of specific gut microbiota, we produce tryptophan, which is an amino acid, and that tryptophan is actually broken down in various substances, not only in one, but in various substances. And all these substances would have a function. For instance, if we go into look at sort of the cellular, the cell lining that I depict there in color, okay, there are some of these that are involved in making sure that the tight junctions in the cells are strong enough. And therefore, that is important for mucosal hemostasis. Some of these are also important for inflammation, for to, to, to as an anti-inflammatory response. Basically, what they do is they induce specific types of immune cells to regulate the others, okay? To keep the, the because there is a constant uh, uh, learning of these immune cells, but you need to keep the inflammation at a low level. So these substances are extremely important to do that, and we need bacteria to transform them. Another thing, for instance, that we see here, you can see one, the pink one at the, um, at the right, so there's five minus HT. That particular compound is extremely important in gastrointestinal motility. Keep in mind, or maybe you don't know, but it's, it's very important to understand that gut motility and gut nervous system is totally autonomous from the brain. The brain does not control when the gut is contracting, the muscles are contracting because you eat, okay? It doesn't do that, so it's totally autonomous, and therefore these neurotransmitters are extremely important to, as a, a way how to control this autonomy and to control muscle movement, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, something that I also mention in most of my social media, because I've, I'm out there also giving information most of the time, all right? Um, I mentioned this 5-HT. It's also known as uh, serotonin and basically also known as the happy hormone, okay? Now, I, we know that tryptophan, through the presence of specific bacteria, we can produce this 5-HT, and also we know that 90% is produced in the gut. Um, so I just always show like that if you don't feel happy, you know, I mean, you're a bit moody, okay, why not take a hot almond milk with pure dark chocolate? That is definitely a tryptophan shot for you, okay. So in addition to this 5-HT, uh, which 95% of it is actually produced in the gut, there are other neurotransmitters that are important um, and are produced in the gut in the presence of specific microbiota. One of them is dopamine, also linked with depression and anxiety. And we know that also low concentrations are related to irritable bowel syndrome and GABA which is also an important neurotransmitter, also, um, also um, uh, involved in, uh, in IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. So, okay, so we mentioned these gut microbiota, we mentioned the metabolites, substance, beneficial substance that are produced in their presence. Uh, and of course, depending on the fuel that we give, uh, the food that we give. But we also know that there is um, disbalance um, in this kind of abundances and diversity of microbiota, which are the microbes. Okay? And this imbalance is called dysbiosis, so an imbalance in the biological um, um, amounts of these um, microbes. This dysbiosis, the imbalance, is associated with various um, conditions including weight gain, obesity, insulin resistance, leaky gut, inflammatory bowel syndromes, and disease, and also depression. Now, if we just have an image like this to show what is this balance, if you go, you look at your right first, you see a balance there, that means this is in balance, okay? And therefore it's called eubiosis, meaning it's in balance. 
And we look at the balance between firmicutes and bacterial datus, these two particular groups that are um, the main uh, microbes in the gut, but also in towards beneficial ones like the bifidobacterium, and also at the pro-inflammatory ones, okay, which we mentioned before, the proteobacterium. Now, if this is all in balance, okay, so in balance, okay, then you produce a, local, a number of uh, short-chain fatty acids, as long as within your diet there are um, complex carbohydrates, otherwise you cannot produce them. And all this together would result in anti-inflammatory action. In the case of dysbiosis, there's definitely a disbalance of these, an increase in pro-inflammatory bacteria and a decrease in beneficial bacteria, resulting in inflammation and all the conditions that I mentioned before. Now, in terms of what one can do, and we will repeat this at the, as the end slide, okay, of course, we need prebiotics to try and move from a dysbiotic situation to an eubiosis. And the first one is definitely um, lipids, correct lipids, because you, you have two, two, two um, advantages with that. First of all, it increases or, or, or sort of moves the dysbiotic into a eubiotic in terms of microbial um, preferences. Yeah, so, so that's very good. And at the same time, it's actually because cells, cell membranes um, are made up of of lipids, okay, the, the, the good lipids, let's say that a good lipid profile is extremely important to keep the cells healthy. And because this lining is only one cell thick, we really need these to be tight and strong and healthy. Um, another thing I mentioned was the tight junctions. Now there is also in the tight junctions, the importance of vitamin D3, okay? So supplementation of vitamin D3 is extremely important in this case as well to keep these cells tight and the barrier integrity as should be. Now, I'm not going into um, diets, but it's only one slide showing that, yes, it is an important factor in this imbalance. And we know of diets like the Mediterranean diet, which is more of an anti-inflammatory diet, where we see um, high abundance of the beneficial bacteria and low abundance of the pro-inflammatory bacteria. Western diets would work the other way around. Okay, so keep an eye on the consumption of Western diet because it is a pro-inflammatory diet. There are various other diets. Most of them are also therapeutic diets. Um, pay attention to therapeutic diets because they are actually um, required for specific individuals with specific needs. It's not a something which should be utilized by everyone. So if we look at and measure these uh, microbiota, then we can actually score dysbiosis. Here I'm sh showing one of the scores, which is called the dysbiotic dysbiosis index from one to five. One to two are non-dysbiotic, so they are healthy. Three is mildly dysbiotic, dysbiotic, and four and five are severely. So if you look at various clinical studies, we know that in a healthy population, 16% of individuals have a mild dysbiosis, and this is totally reversible. So restoration is possible if we find a mild dysbiosis to go back to a healthy one. If you look at irritable bowel syndrome, 70% to 80% have a profile which is higher than two, and then depends on the index, um, one would need to really um, restore um, in different ways. So that is a personalized way how to do it. And because we know what bacteria are being, are, in, uh, are not balanced, then we can actually um, functionally and in, in different ways, increase those specific types. Of course, inflammatory bowel disease, now the, this now going into uh, diseases, they are very difficult to, to restore, but of course, in, in terms of medications, um, we can look into dysbiosis as a complementary, complementary to the treatment, okay, towards restoration of the gut.
Um, so, uh, all right. So, in, the, in terms of dysbiosis, we look at functional profiles. Okay. So, there is, um, so rather than mentioning the names of these bacteria, we say we know which bacteria produce butyrate, which is this very important substance for health. Um, and therefore, we give a mark on that. If there is low butyrate produces, of course, it is wrong. The test result is wrong. And we look at gut mucosa protection, specific gut health markers like f which we mentioned before, okay, pro-inflammatory bacteria. So we actually, the score is based on the functional profiles of the results. So I'm soon ready. So the last uh, two slides here, okay, what is the relevance of this? So microbiota and disease. Yes, there are various diseases that are diet induced. And therefore, it's important to find the dysbiosis, which is mild, so that you can restore it quickly. And these uh, conditions include IBS, um, from, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, obesity and diabetes, atherosclerosis, which would lead to cardiovascular diseases, depression, anxiety, and other neurological diseases, hypothyroidism, and also autoimmune disease. Now, if you have dysbiosis, and therefore also you don't have enough butyrate producing, or maybe you don't even take dietary fibers, so you cannot produce butyrate, then the cell lining is going to collapse. There is permeability. Then permeability would result in inflammation. Inflammation will feed a lot of inflammatory cytokines to other organs. Given that you also have, for instance, a westernized food diet in which you have a lot of colon and l carnitine which produces this particular compound called TMAO, which, by the way, at the right amounts is beneficial. We need it. But unfortunately, when there's dysbiosis and then you continue with uh, hyper-inducing the TMAO production, this would result in atherosclerosis and um, uh, cardiovascular disease. So as I said, yes, there are restoration gut health programs that can be used. First of all, look at lipid profiles, make sure that the profile is correct so that you have healthy epithelial lining. Uh, vitamin D3 is extremely important in the tight junction for this barrier integrity as well. Measure the dysbiosis, make sure what is the problem, go to the cause, utilize specific dietary intakes of what you eat and when you eat and also supplement with prebiotics and, if need be, probiotics to actually restore this disbalance. So that was my last slide. Um, this is session one, which is running in November, so this week. Uh, we had the various sessions. They are all live, by the way. Um, then there is, uh, we will repeat session one in various December live sessions as well. So if you came to session one, please don't, uh, you can come again, doesn't matter, but um, the session session one will continue in December. But then in January, we start different sessions, which will combine sort of the issue of microbiota with different health conditions and go a little bit more detail in those specific ones. In general, these would be as well one hour, which will be half an hour of sort of scientific presentation and half an hour of discussion. Okay. Um, if you want to reach me, you can see my mobile number on your left. I also have a Facebook page that you can, uh, there's all this knowledge about gut health and I keep on um, putting in more knowledge. The name of this Facebook page is Restore Gut Function and Prevent Disease. And there's a full stop in between every, every term. Instagram is what I use as, as an opportunity to share knowledge. So now I open up the discussion. We have an additional um, 15, 10 to 15 minutes. And please, it's your turn. Okay, yes, uh, let me see. Is that a raised hand? So would you just unmute, okay, and and ask ask away. Okay. So thank you for the presentation. Very, very clear indeed. 
also easy to follow. So thank you for, for that. And um, I was particularly in, interested in these neurotransmitters and I'm waiting for the specific um, lesson on this. I have a question. I don't know if it, it is relevant or appropriate in this context. Um, just um, tell me if you can, um, you know, uh, give me some information about that now or maybe in the following session. So I'm very curious to understand a bit better how the fermented food work in our gut. Why fermented food are good for our gut? Uh, I, I know that you didn't mention uh, specifically food in this session, so I don't know if this is appropriate or we will keep it for another session. Yeah, so, so very quick uh, answer to that, but of course there's much more details to what I'm going to say now. Um, uh, fermented foods um, are actually foods that have been um, set up using specific bacterial cultures um, and those bacterial cultures are beneficial so understanding the dysbiosis and which bacteria are out of balance one can also adapt uh, adopt um, specific fermented foods because and fermented foods are prebiotics and probiotics at the same time so you have living beneficial bacteria and with that you are providing the food for these bacteria so that you cultivate them not only you you colonize with these bacteria but also cultivate them in the gut so these are called symbiotics uh, which are prebiotics and probiotics um, so yes there are various fermented foods and it is one way how you can actually provide um, some microorganisms or microbes that you require because of your disbalance mm, thank you um, I really love, you know, kimchi and all that stuff. So, but I couldn't understand exactly how we, they, how, how it works, you know. Well, we can, very yes, system. yes. We can no. add the session nine and we do it on fermented foods. No problem. Very good. Thank we you. Come. Hi, it's Hannah. Hello. Hi, so, so kombucha is is a fermented drink, like it's an example of Sorry? kombucha. I don't know if I'm, yes, I'm yes, pronouncing yes. it well. So that's yes. all part of what she was. Sorry, I don't know your name. What she was just saying. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, these are all uh, kind of uh, fermented foods, but also beverages. Yeah, um, uh -huh. which contain uh, probiotics. Um, but in that case, it doesn't really contain high levels of prebiotics. So one has to pay attention what type you're going of, to of utilize. Okay. Yeah. Because okay, you need fibers, you. you need fibers as prebiotics. So. Um, okay. So. So even sourdough is is sourdough bread. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's more yeast, yeast, uh, yeast uh, oriented in terms of microbes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I have a question here. Does a negative impact from diet in IBS, irritable boy syndrome, necessarily mean an unhealthy diet or that there is an allergy to that particular food that the gut finds difficult to, to digest? Okay, um, so those are two different two different aspects of an unhealthy gut, all right? Um, so um, food in itself, it's it's a huge umbrella. So uh, we 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 will manage to set set a, a session on how food affects microbes, and also there is a session on uh, allergies. Okay. Um, so uh, yes, the, but they are two separate, two separate things. And diet um, affects inflammation. All right, allergy is more related to immunity tolerance. Okay, but I'll, I'll, I need some more time to to explain that. So yeah, right. So there was a question um, by Dorothy. Um, I'll make sure. To, to cover it in subsequent sessions. But I need some time to, 
answer that. I'm going to stop uh, the recording if I manage. Yes, stop recording. <laughs>